Today programme on BBC Radio 4. There should be no border posts between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. That's how the government sees it in the position paper to be published today on one of the core early issues in Brexit talks with the EU. There'll be an emphasis on using technology, CCTV and number plate recognition. Senator Mark Daly is the deputy leader of the Irish opposition party Fianna Fáil and its spokesman on foreign affairs and he's on the line. Good morning. Good morning to you. Would you agree, Senator, with the British government that it's important to avoid any physical border infrastructure and border posts between Northern Ireland and Ireland for any purpose after Brexit? Absolutely. I mean, we have put forward our position on that and Ireland wants to have the best deal on Brexit for Britain because of the over 22.7 billion euros of trade between our two countries annually. And it is vital for the peace process that there is no uh, reimposition of border posts or border checks uh, on this island. Uh, but while Ireland wants to get the best deal for Britain, it appears that Britain doesn't want to get the best deal for itself. It throws out lines about frictionless and seamless borders and hopes that it will get traction in the EU. But hope is not a policy. Um, you know, the reports of the proposal about this frictionless and seamless border appears more like fiction and clueless on this island, it would be a smuggler's charter. There are over 300 miles of border between the north and the south of Ireland, and there are more border crossings on this island than there is between the European let, let, Union let me just put and all you, the countries to the east of it. Let me just put to you some of the detail that is in what they're putting forward today on the custom side of things, that there'd be a continued waiver on submitting entry and exit declarations. If you're a large trader, you could get a trusted trader status you could go through. You'd have a trade exemption if you were a smaller trader, which is the bulk of, of, of the trade across this border. Would that not work at least for the custom side of things? That that what you're talking about there is people who are acting honestly, but what you're not talking about is the people who are going to be dishonest. And if there is trade differentials between the UK and other non-European partners, our border would be a backdoor into Europe. So people would import uh, goods that are cheaper uh, under tariff arrangements with the UK and then bring them into the Republic uh, and so, on into mm. the EU. So, that's, so it's not necessarily that's to do with the way the border arrangements work. It's simply the likely differentials between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom after Brexit. And of course, the UK want an advantage economically over the EU and will do preferential trade agreements with non-EU countries. And, you know, that becomes a smuggler's charter on this island. We already have a smuggling problem problem while both jurisdictions are within the EU. And no. I compiled a report for the Good Friday Agreement Committee and we looked at all these issues and one of the important issues is the issue of people who uh, travel over and back across the border. Over 30,000 people travel over across the border for work, uh, to go to school every day, to go to hospital even. Uh, and one of our key proposals in that report uh, was that any immigration checks would be uh, at Derry, Belfast and Larne. And it, it is quite clear from the British government's position in relation to customs and the fact that they're agreeing that there will be no checks on the border, that there will be also no immigration checks on the border. So what they are essentially is, uh, agreeing to is a surrender of sovereignty which we have all done under the European Union. They are formalising Operation Gull, which is this uh, immigration checks on it, its own internal borders between Northern Ireland and uh, the UK. Uh, and it, last year, in one calendar year, there was over 700 people arrested by UK immigration officers at, at Belfast, Derry and Larne, uh, people trying to get into Britain through the back door of Ireland. So, you know, what they, and we welcome the fact that there won't be immigration checks on the border on this island. But the Brexiteers push for a hard border uh, will push Northern okay. Ireland out of the UK and create a united Ireland. And the Brexiteers also, there is from discussions with people on both communities in the north last week, uh, it, you know, talking especially to the national side, they feel that okay. uh, Brexit Let, will make a successful referendum on a united well, Ireland very it, likely it, in is, the next decade. It, is there not a positive example in, in Norway and Sweden, one country in the EU, one country outside the EU, and they managed to have reasonably smooth trade and crossing points across that border? Absolutely. And that would be, a, that would be a, a practical model if we didn't have the history on this island. Norwegian and Swedish customs officers travel into each other's jurisdictions uh, to chase smugglers to ensure that the arrangements are being 
uh, agreed to. And as you can imagine, it would not be acceptable to the DUP that Irish customs officers would enter into Northern Ireland, nor would it be acceptable to well, that, that the could, people of but Ireland. That could be a point of negotiation, couldn't it? Or would you rule well, it out you, on your if, side? If, I don't think that uh, that Arlene Foster would agree for Irish uh, customs officers to enter into the UK. And uh, believe you me, I wouldn't agree for UK customs officers to enter the Irish Republic. And it, it, that is in terms of the peace process. From the simple practicality of the point of view, you do not want to give dissidents on any side excuses uh, to return to violence. And that's uh, why... The, we all agree with the idea of a seamless and frictionless yes. border. It's the practicalities. And you, you it, quite rightly said the Norwegian model is a great idea. It, but when you go to the practicalities of it, would that work in reality? I don't believe but so. But isn't that history a, a part of the reason why it's important to avoid any physical border posts? Because they could be a, a flashpoint, a, a, a red rag, a, you know, a symbol of the past. Yeah, but as my colleague in, in, in the Dáil has pointed out, our spokesperson on Brexit, uh, Stephen um, O'Donnell, has said many times that, you know, you put up a, a number plate recognition system and that gets attacked and taken down. Well, then you have to put it up again, but then you have to put somebody with a gun uh, minding it the next time. Center. And they are all possible. When Britain finally leaves the EU and we're no longer in the customs union, you might expect there to be customs posts between us and the only EU country with which we have a land border, the Republic of Ireland. But the government's just published a position paper in which it says it doesn't want any physical infrastructure like customs posts on the border. It's an issue that has profound implications for the economy and politics in Northern Ireland, where border controls of any type are often associated with some pretty unwelcome memories. Chris Page has sent this report from near the frontier in County Armagh. This is Cross Maglen. It's a town which was once one of the most dangerous places a soldier could be sent, but it's changed a lot since the troubles ended. There are plenty of reminders of history, a statue dedicated to Republicans, memorial plaques and flags. The borders to the south, west and east. These days it's pretty much invisible, but many people here remember when there were controls, including Jerry Murray, who's editor of the local newspaper, The Examiner. There was a customs post, like a wee wooden hut, and a customs man sitting inside that. You give him a book, he stamped the book, and you went on. Uh, he had the right to come out and say, what have you got in the vehicle, and check the vehicle and see is there any goods that shouldn't be crossing the ball and that, but that was seldom done, but occasionally they did do it. However, people did manage to avoid going down the official route. It was always the thing of jumping the bother, which meant you could... Uh, you went on approved roads, and if the road was blocked, you could go in around people's houses and come out the other side. And during the Troubles, particularly at times of heightened tension during the Troubles, were there extra security checks by the army and what have you? Oh, there was. Well, they were always, uh, they were always on patrol. Uh, and they had the lookout towers and the, the, the singers and the, all that sort of stuff and the helicopters. So... Um, but they never actually stop, tried to stop us crossing the border. You know, you had the right to come and go as you wanted. You know, at the time, we took that for granted, and it's only with when it went away that we realised the conditions we were living under. So border checks used to exist for two reasons. Firstly, for customs controls, which ended with European integration in the 1990s. But there were also those security installations on and around the frontier, which were removed during the peace process. So that left the border essentially open. Brexit isn't going to bring back military fortifications here. But what symbolism would any customs checks have? Professor Lee McGowan is from Queen's University in Belfast. The impact on the politics of Northern Ireland, how would Sinn Féin, the second largest party in Northern Ireland, actually react to the manifestation of customs checks? They could see this as repartition, repartitioning the island. After 20 odd years of a peace process, we're trying to bring the two main communities together. Suddenly this harder Brexit emerges with a harder border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Psychologically, this is, this is problematic. That issue feels particularly real in Cross Maglen, where people hope any hardening of the frontier can be avoided. As long as it doesn't be over militarised like to a point where it turns into abuse, customs might be OK, but they'll have to find some way to deal with it. Well, we don't want it to go back the way it was. Like, you know, that's no good for nobody. Like, I don't think it'll, it'll uh, be good for moving on. And newspaper editor Jerry Murray thinks any new border controls are difficult to imagine. If it were to happen, 
people would rebel. There'd be an element of people who would be delighted to see it because of others. There's no people means making money and smuggling and all the rest. But uh, I can't see it happening. And I hope it doesn't happen. Hmm. That report from Chris Page. Well, with me is the Northern Ireland Secretary, James Brokenshire. Good morning to you. Good morning, John. You want an invisible border, right? That's right. We want uh, the situation to be maintained as much as we can today in terms of uh, people's experience of being able to cross the border, to be able to live their lives in the way that they, they do today. And therefore, the paper that we're publishing underlines that commitment to uh, w- wanting to see any physical infrastructure at the border, as well as a number of other things, such as the common travel area, which has served uh, the UK and Ireland well since the 1920s, uh, and therefore sets out, I think, a number of of key principles for the negotiation and also some outcomes that we would like to see in this first phase where Ireland and Northern Ireland is one of the the key components. But if you want an invisible border, with all that that implies, you have to stay in the customs union, don't you? And it has been made quite clear that you are not going to stay in the customs union. Well, you're right. We have said that we are leaving the customs union and the and the single market as part of our departure from the European Union. But today's uh, today's paper builds on the proposals that David Davis published yesterday in respect to two separate proposals on a streamlined customs arrangement as well well as a new partnership potentially with a customs union, uh, whereby, uh, in essence, you apply uh, the same tariff on goods coming in, but then providing a refund for those goods that remain within the UK market. And so it does set out, I think, in detail the imaginative proposals that Michel Barnier himself has been advocating to find that solution, as well as going beyond that as well, looking well, at certain other regulatory issues too. Michel Barnier said earlier this year, I've heard some people in the UK argue that one can leave the single market and build a customs union to achieve frictionless trade. That is not possible. Well, Michel Barnier has uh, underlined the need for us to find imaginative solutions, recognising, I think, the importance of these border issues in the politics of Ireland uh, and also on security and other issues too and how the EU itself, I think, comes at this with a sense of positive goodwill. Well, let's come to security in a second, if we may, because, Mm. of course, you were security and immigration minister and important issues. But let's stay with the uh, Mm. idea of uh, what Michel Barnier wanted you to do. Imaginative solutions, true, but Guy Verhofstadt, who is leading the um, European Parliament's delegation on Brexit, um, says this this idea of an invisible border is fantasy. So imaginative, yes. Fantasy, no. And this is fantasy, isn't well, it? Well, uh, I don't accept that it, it is fantasy. It is setting out, I think, two uh, proposals for further discussion. Of course, in this first phase, uh, we're looking at departure-related issues and uh, the EU have said, well, we, we welcome the paper for discussion. We want to focus on certain elements in respect of departure first. And why today's paper sets out, I think, some key components to this. All or right. Framing that or framing that discussion, or not wanting to see that physical infrastructure, upholding the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which is absolutely key to all of the politics and everything in Northern Ireland and the which Island Which will be destroyed, according to Dublin, if you leave the European Union. If we leave the European Union, that'll be the end of it. Well, I, find agreement. I, I, don't, I don't accept that. Obviously, the UK voted as an entirety to leave the Indeed. European Union, and that is what we are seeking to implement. And why Quite we so, and have... what, the, and, and, and what Dublin says is that's the end of uh, the Good Friday Agreement. That's it, finished all over. No, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's right to characterise Dublin's view in that way. I think that they have clearly concerned about the implications for Ireland, as we are as well. When you look at the trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, around £2.7 billion, sure. pounds between Northern That's Ireland the and the point. UK, hmm. £10.7 billion pounds too. And therefore, those north-south and east-west relationships matter really essentially. And also the unique relationship, the unique status of the island of Ireland, which is why today's paper, for example, goes into other issues such as the single electricity market, a unified unit in relation to how electricity supply is right. provided in Ireland. So there's a lot of detail that you'll see in the paper today that I think underlines the unique situation that we have in uh, on but, the island but, of Ireland and, and needing to... To work with our EU partners to find that solution but, but that provides you, the ultimate, but, but ultimate what outcome. But what you want, and obviously one appreciates that this is a negotiating mm. position, um, you want to have the cake and eat it. You want to have a relationship that is very much like 
membership, continuing members of the Customs uh, Union, a frictionless Irish border and the freedom to reach new trade deals with other countries. <laughs> Simply unrealistic, isn't it? Well, I, 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 don't accept, I don't accept that it is unrealistic. One of the key things... Why would as they you agree? Know, Why is... would Brussels conceivably agree with that? And well, more to the point, why would the other 27 countries possibly agree to that? Well, I think because of the, the trade that we have in both directions. This isn't just some sort of unilateral one-way issue that I, I'm sort of talking about here. When you look at, yes, the trade that the UK has, for example, with Ireland, around £13.6 billion, but but equally the trade from Ireland to the UK of around £9.1 billion. Is it, is that, it, is that it, sort of, it is that flow of trade that we do see in both directions, mm. which is why, but, actually, this matters for both of us. Yes, but you don't even know how it would work, this um, invisible border. How would it work? I mean, would there be a computer in every cab of every lorry? Would there be number plate recognition? I mean, what, mm. how would it work? Well, there, there are a number of elements that the paper highlights today on, yes, the two proposals in relation to uh, the customs the way that they could be operated on a streamlined basis or a new customs partnership. But also looking at what we actually are talking about on trade, how 80% of what the island of Ireland sees on those movements of goods between uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is actually small business. It's not international trade at all. It's about uh, actually it leaves twenty percent, which it's, is it's, it's it's actually about business operating in local markets and why we think there is a strong, compelling case to see that exemption. How yes, on goods in transit, how we're advocating that being remaining part of the the common transit. But you're not telling us how it would work. Sense. Well, it's about uh, it's obviously about the uh, the way in which de- Declarations are made. How? And so, and so, John, we... No, I'm asking you for, for a wee bit of detail mm. here. How, we know how normal customs mm. posts work perfectly well. Somebody stops the lorry, they hand over the documents, they get checked over, bump, and they're on their way. Mm. There isn't going to be a post, mm. is there? There isn't going to be a physical post. So how would it work when the lorry turns up with goods, mm. not one of your 80%, but the other 20%, when your lorry turns up with the goods, what happens to it? Well, there, there are trusted traders uh, and those sort of relationships, what, what are described as authorised economic operators. But again, doesn't and account pre, for all of Pre-registration, them. and therefore how technology... And and new systems that HMRC is putting in place around customs declarations, which we've done since the 1990s. But again, online, all of that has to be to... checked. At what point does that happen? Well, let, let me give you an example. At the moment, we have we have separate arrangements in relation to excise duties that operate between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Those sorts of checks where they may need to be done are done away from the border. And so all I'm saying, John, is that through technology, through a pragmatic, practical way... But you way don't know what the technology... To do Sorry to keep interrupting, but mm. you, you, you're, you're kind of glossing over from a say so that this new technology thing nobody seems to think it will work it hasn't worked anywhere else well uh, th- that's why that's why i make the point john on this not being all about technology why <laughs> well, it's no, about you can't answer why, the no, question no, 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 about no, technology I, that's the problem no no, no I, I don't accept that it is about registration and therefore how you're able to make your declarations and creating yes that's those systems that can assist this but it is also about exemption it is also about regulation too because we focused a lot about customs declarations, but the paper today also talks, to, for example, in relation to something quite specific on the island environment, which is agri-foods. Very important business. Sure. Around 25% of milk that uh, starts off in Northern Ireland goes to the Republic mm. for processing. And how equally, from a regulatory perspective, we're saying there may need to be greater adherence on those sorts of standards between what happens in Northern Ireland and the Republic and of Ireland And what about too. the movement of people? Mm. Immigration. Yes. You used to be the immigration minister. Absolutely, John. And, and something that has been uh, common throughout that process, or that throughout, uh, throughout the period of, uh, since the 1920s, has been the common travel area. That ability for people to travel freely between the island of Ireland and Great Britain, between Northern Ireland and the Republic and of Ireland. And when we're out of the EU, you would accept expect that to continue so somebody could pitch up in Dublin they'd be accepted into Dublin then they could somebody who is not an, uh, a British national then they could pop across to Belfast and magically become a sort of quasi British citizen rather strange well, system isn't it? we would expect the common travel area to continue uh, and indeed the common travel area predates both Ireland and the UK's membership of the European sure, Union a few things and have the, changed since then and as the, you very and well the special, know the special rights that actually Irish citizens have 
uh, as a consequence of the Ireland Act 1949. A lot of the previous agreements that we have reached between ourselves and the yeah. Irish government recognising the very special arrangements that we have and that unique relationship that we have with the Irish government too. And yes, we do How want do that to continue. using Dublin to get into Britain? Well, the, the Irish government themselves are introducing uh, new standards, new systems to be able to look at uh, what you might describe as the external common travel area how we work together, how we have a shared and mutual interest, how this goes to the partnership arrangements that we have developed with the Irish government and indeed EU partners too, in terms of the use of passenger name records and other systems as well. And how, yes, this points to the need for continuing relationships, continuing partnership with our EU colleagues in terms of, yes, that fight against Islamist-related terrorism, those who travel internationally to commit acts of terrorism. That is something that will be maintained and how we want to see that partnership continuing in that fashion, knowing that, yes, right. the common travel area is one component of this and how we continue to work very closely with the Irish government in actually toughening up those standards. We have to talk about devolution because your job, this job, the job we've been talking about, is made more difficult by the fact that there is no mm. Belfast government as we speak. You're right. We don't have an executive in Northern Ireland, and, and that's something that I earnestly want to see at the earliest opportunity. There are divisions that remain between the two main parties, Sinn Féin and the DUP, that we will continue to work with them to see that they are able to uh, find that But will you, in the end, if it comes to it, will you have to impose a budget, for instance? Well... Time is moving on. Northern Ireland has not got a effective budget that's been set for this financial year. And the more that we go into the autumn, the tougher that that gets on public services. And ultimately, I've said that if a budget can't be set, if the reconciliation can't be achieved and this becomes intractable, yes, we would be prepared to legislate in Westminster to actually have a budget could, set there. Could we be facing, and I know you'll say we don't want this, of course, and you're working to avoid it, but could we be facing the imposition of direct rule once again. Well, do you know what? I think that agreement can be reached. Uh, I think this remains think it possible. Will be reached, uh, it and, can be reached if and, everybody did X, Y and Z, but realistically, hmm. will it be reached and if so, when? But, but uh, you know, I've equally been clear that we as the UK government have duties and responsibilities to the people of Northern Ireland around good governance, around political stability. That's right. so why I make the point about saying that we would be prepared to legislate. In other words, budget. if they can't get their act together, direct rule is a real possibility. Well, I think that there is, there is obviously a challenge of greater and greater intervention from the UK government. That is profoundly not what I want to see. It's profoundly what I don't think is in the interest of Northern Ireland and therefore how we will continue to use all of our influence and endeavours to find that agreement and resolution between the two parties because that's what Northern Ireland needs. Be direct rule, hasn't it? Well, no, I, I think that we're, we're still all not right. there yet, John, and that's why we will continue to I work know. with them to see that we get a Northern Ireland executive. And do you know what? Brexit at the moment, why this matters so much and having that voice from Northern Ireland mm. alongside us advocating for that success for Northern Ireland outside of the EU but within the EU. Okay.